Fiona. Um, and I'm a search engineer, and I'm going to talk to you about search engines and nail polish. Um, so to explain a little bit about how those are connected, uh, I used to have a huge nail art problem. This photo is from like the peak of my nail art days, when I actually got 100 Pinterest repins on my gradient nails. <laughs> <laughs> That's my credibility up front. Um, and I was spending too much time doing my nails, too much uh, money on nail polish, and my cuticles were destroyed. So I decided to kind of go cold turkey. Um, I hid my nail polishes. I blocked my browser from accessing the subreddit. Um, but the one thing I couldn't avoid was I just kept seeing it in my old diary entry. So I had this diary, and it's full of entries like this, which are just like tips and tricks and just like stuff about nail polish that would totally um, remind me how much I liked it. And I kept kind of stumbling across them either accidentally or, or accidentally on purpose um, when I was missing my hobby. But I didn't want to delete them entirely um, for posterity. So I wrote a search engine program in Python called Acetone. So this is just a search engine, not for the web, just for like my diary entries, which are stored locally on my file system in plain text. Um, and it doesn't use any search technologies like Solar or Elasticsearch. It's just like totally from scratch. Um, and my goal in seeing that is not to impress you that I did this from scratch, but um, to convince you that search engines are really simple and beautiful and clever. So what is a search engine? Um, of course, it's like a text retrieval mechanism. I, I enter a text query, and I get back relevant documents. Um, but unlike grep, it doesn't scan through every document um, when it's for every uh, query. It leverages a pre-processing step called indexing to create a file or a set of files called a search index that can be used on every query to speed up lookup. Um, I don't really care about performance just for these little local plain text files, um, but I'll be taking advantage of this pre-processing step to kind of hide some, some of the nail polish stuff for myself. Um, so imagine that we are indexing some nail polish names. Um, so what this pre-processing step actually does uh, is that it kind of steps through every document, and it looks at every term, and it creates a mapping um, from the term to the list of document IDs that contain that term. And I use this example because nail polish names are both very short, and they're also very weird and hilarious. <laughs> These are all real nail polish names from Etsy Nail Polish. Um, and so once it's done this and, and built out these lists, now we have a mapping from, so like about is the documents one, three, and four, so you see a list of documents one, three, and four. Um, same for pink, which shows up in documents two and three. So now when I want to go back in and look these up, I just go to pink and I grab out those documents and I return those two, two relevant nail polishes. Um, and it's not much harder to handle two terms. So for a query like pink about, we just grab both lists um, and we do a set intersection. And now we have that one document that matches both the words pink and about. Cool. Um, so the one thing that is not so great about the system is that there's really two documents here that are relevant to the query pink about. Both um, pink about it, which we returned, and thinking about you. Um, and, and this is kind of a contra contract example. But in general, you kind of have this problem where if you have something that's like pluralized in the text, but you search for it in the singular or vice versa, then you're not going to retrieve that because all we have is these kind of naive document mappings um, with the original term. Um, so we've got to do some text normalization. Um, this is called the analysis chain. So back to my journal entry. Um, what we've got here is just like a big blob of natural language text. Um, and the first step in the analysis chain is called tokenization. And that takes that big text blob and just emits a stream of words. So now we have a nice stream of individual tokens. Um, the second step is called stop words. And that basically drops out really common semantically meaningless terms. So we dropped out is, to, I. Um, and that kind of keeps the index size manageable without actually affecting that many queries. Um, so finally, we do stemming, which is kind of like the heavy lifting of text normalization. So a stemmer is a long chain of rules that kind of iteratively strips suffixes and tries to output some notion of like the essence of the root of a word. Um, so you can see chips became chip, so it handles it handles uh, plurals. Um, and, and pinking, um, which was that problem from the nail polish example, becomes pink. So now we can look this up by pink. Um, and so this step has to happen both to the tokens in the document as they're being input to the indexer and to the, the token that you query, or else I would search pinks match on anything because it got, got stemmed down to pink. Um, cool. So this is the end of the analysis chain. Um, and we got this nice kind of robot-friendly text that's ready for indexing. Um, so 
so now I'm ready to talk about like the mods that I've done to make uh, this, this safe search mode for a nail polish. <laughs> so the goal of mod number one is that there's some words that I know for sure I shouldn't be searching. Uh, acetone, top coat, uh, Etsy and OPI, these are all really nail polish specific terms that I shouldn't even be searching for them, so I might as well not invent them. Um, so if you remember stop words from the analysis chain, I could use that, I could add those to stop words and kind of drop them on the floor. Um, but I think we could actually do one better. So um, especially words like uh, nail polish brands, like Etsy and OPI, are often followed by the full nail polish name. Um, so, and I shouldn't be searching for that. So I'm gonna intervene in the tokenizing step um, and if I see something like acetone, then I just drop it. But if I see something like Etsy, I want to also drop the next three tokens. Um, and so this is how this stream would be transformed. And this is the code. So this is the original tokenizer. Um, and it's super simple, thanks to the generator pattern in Python. You just read in a line, break it out by white space, yield a token, and I have a nice uh, stream of tokens that I can use uh, in the indexer. And so what I'm going to mix in here is a blacklist, which associates each term with a, um, an integer representing how long afterward I should keep dropping tokens. So now the tokenizer is a bit more complex, um, but it's still fairly simple. So if it sees a term that's in the blacklist, for one thing, it doesn't yield that token. Um, and for another thing, it sets a counter and starts counting down um, and only begins yielding tokens again when it's reached zero. So this gets us to uh, the original tokenized document looking like this. And post, post this step, it looks like this. So we've dropped top coat, acetone, but we've also dropped the full nail polish name. And I won't be able to search any of that in the future. Um, so this is pretty good. But I still see some terms in there like glitter and chip that are not nail polish specific, but pretty nail polish relevant. So I don't necessarily want to totally remove them from the index, but I do want to make it a little bit harder for myself to find them. And so I was really inspired by the Sierra video in which she changes her ex's name to old news in her phone. Um, she also <laughs> drops it in a fishbowl, but I was more inspired by this idea of kind of adding a cautionary alias um, to in the uh, stomach. So um, <laughs> basically what I'm gonna do is alias terms with like that I'm moderately confident are about nail polish in some way to um, kind of like a rhyming scheme version of themselves and I'll be forced at query time to search by the alias. So this is what that list looks like. I've got this rhyming scheme. <laughs> I've mapped all these terms to something that'll remind me not to get too nostalgic. So if I want to look up lacquer, I can remember lacquer is whacker, um, and then search by that. <laughs> so the code for this is super simple. Look it up, see if it's in the, the list of aliases, and swap it out if it is. Um, and the, the key insight is that this time, unlike every other stemming thing which needs to happen both at, at query time and at index time, I only want to do this transformation at index time because if I did it in both, then I would search lacquer, it would get transformed to whacker, it would match on those, those term mappings, um, and I, would, I wouldn't have changed the results at all. Um, so now the original post dummy document looks like this, and after the aliasing step, we've got these, these aliases, glitter, quaint, whatever. <laughs> so I won't be able to look these, these things up without remembering the alias. Um, okay, cool. So this brings me to the, the final modification. Um, so maybe you've noticed that I actually haven't even gone close to the terms nail and polish, um, even though those are the most nail polish relevant terms. Um, and that's because I have documents like this, which contains the word nail, <laughs> documents like this, which contains the word polish or polish. Um, so they're both actually pretty common words that have other meanings. And I don't, I don't want to even alias them um, and, and stop myself from accessing them like that. So what I need is a way to blacklist a phrase um, and not a word. But I can't really map. Uh, I can't really do that when all I have is maps from uh, from terms to sets of IDs. I won't know where in the document the terms actually appear. Um, so what I really want to be able to do is something like this. When I have a query, I want that query and not any documents containing the phrase nail polish. So now I need to modify the tokenizer again um, to yield some information about the position of that word in the context of the document. So instead of yielding just a token, I'm going to yield uh, a tuple with the position the, as an integer um, in the context of the document and the token itself. Um, and construct a kind of modified postings list where instead of a term mapping to a list of IDs, I have a term mapping to a dictionary uh, from that ID, the document ID, to the, a list of positions in the document. So now enough shows up at positions one and three, so that's why you see that 
was 23, and is is at position two. Um, and so this complicates the searcher step a little bit because now doing an intersection of, of sets was fine, but doing an intersection of dictionaries just doesn't make that much sense. This is not this is not going to work. Um, so I'm not going to linger too long on this because uh, it's somewhat complicated. But with the right abstractions uh, for iterating through lists and finding a match predicate, this code can actually be pretty simple. Um, we got this super cute recursive uh, phrase merge across when you have more than than two terms. Um, and now it works something like this. Well, I'll wait for it to restart. But um, it used to be when I searched for nail, I would see both documents, including the nail polishy one. But adding back in that code, all of a sudden, I'm able to limit it to um, the documents that, that, I, that I'm safe to look at. <laughs> um, so thank you so much uh, for listening. Um, I'll be around if you have any questions about uh, search engines or if you want to know my pick for the uh, greatest quick drive talk. So, <laughs> <laughs>